where you don't have to toil and, and break your back every single time to earn that money. In fact, a good e-farmer, okay, and I'm not exaggerating this, a good e-farmer produces more in a day than many people who work average jobs make in a month of working eight hour days and really, really grinding it out. That's the power of owning an e-farm. It gives you tremendous leverage and of course, lifestyle and freedom. You're listening to The Growth Booth, the show focused on achieving lifestyle freedom through online businesses. Whether you're looking for step-by-step -step strategies to start building an online business, simple game plans to grow your business, or proven lifestyle freedom frameworks, you are in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the thousands of listeners already in growth mode. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Growth Booth. This is episode number 59 and I'm here with you today, Aiden Booth, and I've got a very special guest, someone who I met in person for the first time not that long ago. His name is Igor Kafitz, and you may have heard of Igor. He's been doing some really, really interesting things uh, behind the scenes with internet marketing, building a business, and just getting some truly amazing results. And one of the things that has always struck me about uh, Igor, uh, and this is from even before I met him in person to now actually having hung out with him for a good couple of days and sat down, had dinner with him and drank numerous coffees with him uh, and just chatted to him a lot is he seems to have a really good balance of lifestyle, which I think a lot of people tend to, to, to neglect or just lack altogether. So um, Igor, firstly, thank you so much for tuning in here today and, and being on the show. You kidding me? It's a, it's a true honor and a pleasure. I've been, uh, when I started in the game, I think you already, you were pretty big. So for me to be on your show is just a, a true, true pleasure. Um, I subscribed to it, by the way, a couple months ago. So uh, as soon as I heard that you started it. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to be here and hopefully, um, make it a tremendous episode one for the books awesome and speaking of books i know that you've got a, an awesome book which I, i've just finished going through myself and uh, people can see what that's all about and check it out by going to eaglesbook.com and that'll take you to a page where you can get all the information uh, about this and i know that that dives into more uh, around this whole conversation of lifestyle and i, I guess Something that I see, I don't know if you've seen this as well, Igor, but I sometimes see people who are doing okay financially, but they've got zero time freedom or they've got this new like work from home thing since after the pandemic. So they've got a little bit of geographic freedom, they're able to move around, but then they don't have some of the other bits and pieces. So what's your take on it all? I mean, do you really have to choose between... You know, lifestyle freedom or income or family or relationships or fitness like how, how do you how can someone structure things so that they can have the best of all worlds you know i used to believe the i used to believe that you can't i used to believe that you really had to choose and i grew up in a family that put me on a path to traditional nine to five right so my my dad was military my mom was a music teacher and um the message was go to school get good grades find a good job and hopefully when you're 50 you can become the CEO of something and um, you'll be you'll be all right and that's the reason why they sent me to the Israeli Air Force Academy when I was a kid because they felt by going through this academy um, I'll have a great career in the military I'll be able to retire from the military when I was 45 and then with military experience usually what happens in Israel which is where I'm originally from you get recruited into like these big corporate um, conglomerates and you can move up uh, the ladder and you know going to school I was surrounded by people whose dream was get a company car get a company cell phone at the time we were still using cell phones not smartphones and um, the, you know and a paycheck in the high four figures uh, that was like the ultimate dream and you know for many years I believed that to be the dream until one day I was really stressed out before my aerodynamics exam and I uh, was hanging out with my buddy Max. Now, Max wasn't a straight A student like me. Max was pretty much a, a deadbeat at the time. He was already almost like one one foot out of high school, you know, almost dropped, dropped out, smoking, partying hard. And uh, I was really stressed out. And, and Max was like, why are you stressed out, bro? 
And I'm like, well, I got this big aerodynamics exam coming up. And he's like, so what? It's like, what do you mean, so what? I want to do well. It's like, yeah, but why? Why do you want to do well in an aerodynamics exam? What do you even need that for? It's like, well, I don't really need it. It's just I need to get good grades so I can get a good job and become rich. And he started laughing at me. I was like, what are you laughing about? It's like, that's not how you become rich. I was like, what do you know about becoming rich? You're practically, you know, homeless uh, in a few years because you're a deadbeat. And, uh, you know, uh, he said, well, you know, I'm obviously, I'm not the person to listen to about this. However, he says, my dad is reading this book by someone called Robert Kiyosaki. It's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in that book, he explains that the richest people in the world are not the smartest people or straight A students. I was like, yeah, but that's, that's just a ludicrous idea. He said, no, 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 you should read the book. And you know what? I actually did read the book. I went to his place. I got the book from his dad and I read the book. And that book, that book blew me away. It basically made me believe in this one simple idea that you, you are not born rich, you become rich. And you can become rich even if you start out poor. From there, it sparked this journey uh, which of course culminates today and hopefully it'll culminate many, many years from now, not today, but you know, um, I ended up building a multiple six figure income, um, about a year and some, the year and change after I, um, got out of the Israeli army because in Israeli, in Israel, the Israeli, the army service is mandatory. And then from there, I, I kept scaling and scaling and scaling uh, to a point where it's now uh, multiple seven figures every year. And what's really interesting about this, which ties really into the idea of having lifestyle and income and the freedom, is that I work the same amount of hours today as I did when I was making six figures, as I did when I was making five figures with this business, which is a testament to the idea that you really don't have to choose. You can have your lifestyle, you can have your freedom, you can shape your life in the way that you see it. For, ex for instance, I'm a father. I got two kids, 10 and 4, and um, whenever my daughter has a, a play, she acts. Uh, whenever my son has a judo practice or he's got you know something that's happening in his world, like I can actually put everything on pause and I can go and give them attention. Now, this is not to say that I spend 24-7 with my kids, right? I'm not that good of a father. I, I still get bored and, you know, I really love what I do. But whenever I need to be there, I'm there. There's never been a moment besides one time when I did fly out to a seminar uh, when I wasn't there for them when they were performing or doing something or they needed help or whatever. Even today as we're uh, shooting this episode, um, you know, my kids know they can actually run downstairs to me. I work out of my home basement and they can interrupt me, uh, which is not the best thing for productivity, but they know they can. They don't feel like they're not important. You know, I was growing up and I remember only playing. Uh, so I was born in Ukraine and I immigrated to Israel when I was 12. So I grew up first in Ukraine, then in Israel. And I only remember playing football with my dad once or twice in my whole life because he was never around. So, you know, when I decided to have a family, you know, I knew I'm going to do it right. I knew I'm going to do it in a way where, you know, my kids won't have to compete with my quote unquote job, if you know what I mean. You, you know, this is um, really interesting. We, we've got lots of parallels here. So when I was uh, about 19 years old, I was studying uh, at university, essentially what would have turned into a, I would have eventually become a manager in a, in a big factory or company or something. That's, that's really where my degree was pointing me. And I was at a birthday party with uh, some other university students and I got talking to one of my friends and I don't know how the topic come up, but he said, oh my God, you've got to check out this book. A friend of mine gave it to me uh, and it's called Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I'd never heard of it. I was, you know, I was 19 years old at the time. And uh, so sure enough, I, I went and, and had a look at it and it was like a switch flipped inside me and at that stage i was like oh passive income that's a thing i can get this passive income you know working for me potentially and for me then it was even just 
you know, fifty, one hundred dollars a day would have been even less than that because I was, I was a poor student. Would have been magical. So for me, what I took out of that book was yes, definitely passive income. Definitely, um, you don't need money to start money. What you need is a desire. And I went on to read, I think, uh, every single book that the Kiyosaki brand, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, uh, put out and uh, have read many, many more since. What is your favorite Kiyosaki book? Oh, man. It's going back um, we're going back almost almost 20, well, yeah, 20 years. Uh, well, definitely that one there is probably the most... Um, memorable i mean cash flow quadrant was uh, a good one as well we yeah. talk about yeah. uh, working talk about getting systems. money to work for you rather than yeah, 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 yeah. being an, yeah. an employee i think you're great at that too um, i think you're great at that like i've studied you over the years of course and seen you the way you do things and i think you're a true testament and an example a real life example of a guy uh, from the from the um the cash flow quadrant book that who build the pipeline right right so in the beginning of the book he tells the story about the guy who kind of i love that pulls the buckets the with water example yeah right yeah and so there's other guy he builds a pipeline so yeah you're you're incredibly skilled at that and i think the people um who truly want passive income who truly want to have lifestyle freedom while scaling their income year to year um they should embrace this concept of a pipeline. They should embrace this concept of building something that can produce $1,000 a week automatically versus trying to make $10,000 per week by hustling to get that money. Because I've been, I've done both and I burn out real quick. Yeah, yeah. The hustle is, is definitely a, a recipe for disaster when you keep doing it for too long. So, you know, what has been your uh, sort of go to? Um, recipe, if you like, for being able to achieve this lifestyle freedom, which so many people have, have struggled with. What's been what's been the things or the things that have worked well for you? Well, first off, it was the transition from the idea that I have to close every sale or or go do the legwork to make the money. So in other words, I actually at one brief moment in my journey in this industry, in this game, in this uh, entrepreneurial journey, I, I switched from trying to build systems to trying to go and close deals with people almost one on one, whether it was meeting with them, whether it was getting them on the phone, whether it was like chatting with them somewhere on like a platform, I, I really was going for um, the, the, the sale, I kind of became um, very sale oriented and I started offering a service and trying to close uh, the deals. And what I quickly learned is that there's only so many hours in the day and I can't possibly scale if that's how I earn my living because there's only so many conversations I can have in a span of a work day. There's only so many days in a, in a calendar month or year and I was constantly limited. Um, and what's even worse is that if that month I wasn't necessarily closing well, I ended up trying to hustle, re, you know, harder towards the end of the month to cover for the for the gap, and therefore I was sacrificing time with my family. I was saying no to my wife. I was saying no to my daughter. I was basically showing them they weren't important to me, and uh, it actually it kind of peaked at a certain stage when I was working all day long on my laptop, like trying to message people, trying to have phone calls with people, trying to get people on like Zoom calls and stuff. Well, at the time we weren't calling it Zoom. Uh, we were actually using something called Join Me or Skype. I don't know. Like right now it's a little bit easier because back then technology kind of struggled with the whole screen sharing and webcam sharing thing. But I was like hustling for the lack of a better word. And I remember it was like 8 or 9 p.m. And I turned everything off and I was like, you know, just kind of taking this breather. And I stepped out of my... Uh, room, which was my my bedroom, my office, my game room, and everything in between, besides my bathroom. And I noticed there was no one home. What happened was my wife just left. Can you believe it? Like she just got tired of waiting. Turns out earlier that day she tried to talk to me, asking me questions or something. Um, asked me if we wanted, if I wanted to go somewhere, and I completely ignored her because I was so 
in the zone trying to build something, maybe a landing page or talking to somebody, you know, chatting or writing an email, whatever. And uh, she just took our baby daughter and uh, she walked. She walked, she disappeared. I started calling her best friends. I started calling my friends, you know, mutual friends. You know how, like, if you're married, then you won't, you're mostly friends with other couples. You can, you're not really allowed to have single friends anymore. So I started, like, calling everybody. And, um, you know, no one knows where she is. And that, at that point, I knew there's only one place where she could be, which is at her mother's place. And I went, and uh, I got her to come out and talk to me. And that was the day when, when I pledged. I basically said, okay, I promise you, I will change this. I will not hustle anymore. I will figure out a way to do it right um, because you're important to me. Today's show is brought to you by the Blueprint Academy, a coaching service that I've been providing for about eight years now. If you're interested in getting one-on-one coaching from me and my team of experts, as well as being able to leverage the resources and infrastructure that I've got in my business, then head over to thegrowthbooth.com forward slash academy to get all the details. I'm passionate about helping people build businesses online, and this is where I can help you. So again, head over to that link, thegrowthbooth.com forward slash academy, and find out how we can help you at the blueprint academy today right it's moments like that sometimes when you realize um even if you had all the finances in the world and you had complete financial freedom for whatever you're doing it's all kind of worthless if you don't have a means to enjoy it or you know you could have all the money in the world but if you're not healthy then what's the point you can't actually be out there and, and really enjoy it all that much and i think that's why this idea of, of balance is so, you know, mission critical. How, how do you maintain balance? I mean, do you have a routine that you go through on a daily basis? And because it's also quite easy to fall into that trap of being so like in the forest and unable to see the bigger picture when you're working and you're focused on something. So how do you control that in your life? And are there any routines that you have? Yeah, it's actually even more difficult when you consider that you're making money and every time there's a payment coming in, there's endorphins hitting your brain like crazy, right? Because, you know, if you're in the business to make money, which I hope you are in the business to make money, um, and you and you like get on the phone with somebody or you send an email and money starts coming in, you, the first thing you want to be doing is go write another email, go have another call. And so that's how I was. And... Um, you know, I, I, I truly had to take a step back and reevaluate how I'm building my business because at the time my business was just me. And um, I had to take a step back and, and, and start building out systems that give me leverage where I could still be investing the same amount of hours or minutes or effort, but at the same time, I could actually start scaling my income through the means of leverage. And so to answer your question, my work day is uh, something like this. I wake up around... Um, these days around 6, 6.30 a.m. And then I try to get in like an hour, maybe an hour and a half of work before everyone else wakes up. Because as soon as everyone wakes up, like I said, I got a son and a daughter. It's just, you know, it's impossible to get anything done. Uh, even if you're hiding in the I, basement. I know what like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, the first hour, hour and a half of each day, I give it to myself. And sometimes I alternate between two things. Sometimes if I've got like a big project I'm building or something, I'm gearing up to a product launch or whatever, I'll give that hour to the thing. So I'll give an example. Um, when I was writing my book, right, I would wake up and the first hour of every day I would devote to my book. And that was very productive because I ended up writing that book in 13 days. So that was like real quick. I think that's the secret to getting stuff done, especially if you're a really busy individual, is you wake up a little bit earlier before your, your entire household is, is up on their feet and you give that one hour to yourself and your biggest project. You'll be surprised how quickly you can move forward if you're just operating without distractions. Now, once that hour is done, I go upstairs, we have breakfast together. I try to like have breakfast with my kids uh, So because I, I found that sharing a meal with anyone, not just your family, it brings you closer. So if you've got a routine of um, kind of sharing a meal with your loved ones, even if you're really busy elsewhere and you don't get to see them too much throughout the day, you still feel and they feel like you guys are connected. And actually, funny story, I learned it from a mobster. Um, when I was growing up in Ukraine, 
um, it was in the 90s. Now, Ukraine in the 90s, shortly after the wall coming down, it's a very nasty place. The only people who were making any money were actual criminals, and they were doing racketeering, stealing stuff. I mean, classic mafia stuff, right? Now, my dad was retired military at the time, and he was connected to all sorts of criminals in the city because you're either friends with them or you're their enemy. So you're either friends with them or they come racketeer your business. So he went on and he did something smart. He befriended the biggest mobster in the in the in town. It was a city. Uh, the city's called uh, Bila Tsirkva. and um, in that town at the time there was one guy. His name was Nikolai Makarenko, or uh, his uh, nickname was Makar. So Makar was basically the most feared gangster in town. He had the police in his pocket, everything. Like, I'm, I'm talking classic 1930s Chicago mobster style story. And uh, there's one thing, though, about him that I, that me and my dad actually admired a lot. And I admire it more today than before. And that is he never missed lunchtime at home. So we're talking, uh, you know, a guy who killed people for a living, a guy who racketeered people, but he still made it a point to go home for lunch, to have lunch with his wife and his daughter. Yeah, he must be like he must be like in the middle of a in, in the middle of something big, and he's like, I just I'm not going to kill this guy quite yet. I've got to get home for lunch and eat my knockies, and then uh, I'll get back and finish the business later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure that's it's a exactly joke. It's a joke, but it's probably real. <laughs> Dude, in every joke, there is a part joke and a part, you know, reality. So I'm pretty sure it's exactly how it unfolded in some days. But you see, uh, it's a it's a big thing because I made it a point starting, um, you know, at a certain time in my development to have breakfast with the kids, to have uh, dinner with the kids. And I think it's an important part of the day to help me stay connected because I believe, uh, first of all, I do believe that money is important. I believe if you're completely and utterly broke, it is your obligation to make yourself financially um, capable so you can go and make some money and give a better life to your family. I do believe that my first priority as a leader of this household is to provide for this household first and foremost. Like if I was dead broke right now, I wouldn't be having breakfast with my family. I wouldn't be having lunch with them. I would be out there making money until I had something where I felt comfortable and secure that I'm providing enough. However, um, then I do believe that um, after the money is set and you know you can afford to start building systems, maybe hiring people, investing in technology, using software, do automation, uh, that's when... Um, I believe that the quality of your life will be largely determined by the quality of your relationships. And this is not a concept I learned from a, from a buddy of mine, Cabral, who's really big into relationships. Um, he really mastered, I think, that part of life. And so um, if your relationships to your spouse, to your children, to your friends, best friends, uh, colleagues, etc., if those are quality relationships, juicy, meaningful relationships, you will always find your life to be meaningful, enjoyable, and uh, life of quality. So between those things, you know, that's where I invest my time. I, I invest in relationships. I invest in, in my business. I invest in my family. So after kids leave, um, you know, my, my wife will do the school run. I go back to work and I work up until about 1 p.m., sometimes 2 p.m., depending on how well I flow, depending on how much I feel like working. Some days, like yesterday, you know, I honestly feel yesterday was a wasted day because I really didn't get much done at all. Like, I found myself playing video games at like 11 a.m. So uh, it wasn't like a very productive day. But the good thing is that my systems kept working. So my life didn't fall apart, you know, I could afford it. Um, but that's my, that's my uh, goal is to work first hour to give it to myself then have this, um, you know, for maybe like 9am until 12 or 1, sometimes 2pm, I'll do more work. But then it's lunchtime. And after that, it's just quality time based on what I determined that to be be it date night and you know go to the movies with my wife or uh, go play some some video games you know I'm big on, on video games so you can tell like yesterday I spent a lot of time playing um, on my oculus quest 2 
Do you know what that is? Have, uh, you, have you tried yeah, it? Yeah, I have an, an Oculus. It's um, amazing. Yeah, so I love Pistol Whip. I love uh, Beat Saber. Um, you know, it's just... Uh, you know, it's funny. In, uh, you know what's my, my daughter's, my 10-year-old daughter's favorite game in Oculus? It? It's the Job Simulator. The Job Simulator. <laughs> wow, I haven't, I haven't actually seen that one. Like yes, I was like, oh my god, you're like an entrepreneur's daughter. You can't be playing this game. No, but she actually enjoys, uh, you know, pretending she's like doing something important, like you know, and and the job she she selects, like you know, a waitress or cook, a cook, like she cooks eggs and stuff. There's this, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. Like it's a game where the human is working for the robots, and the human right. is cooking for the robots and serving the food. Yeah, so it's it's really uh, it's, it's funny really how um, kids love that that kind of role playing. Often um, walk into my daughter's room, and she's uh, younger, so my daughter's four years old, and my son is six, and she'll be uh, jabbering away to some of her her dolls there and uh, play, playing the role of a teacher or a mother or whatever it is that occurs to her on that day. But uh, role playing, uh, it's also really important in their um, education and and development. A um, couple of things that. Um, I wanted to add on there to what, what you said. I think routine is, is really, really important in the day. I'm like you where I like to get an early start um, and try to get something meaningful done before uh, the house becomes chaos, which typically happens at around about 7 a.m. So this morning I got up and got started at 20 past 5. And I thought, okay, fantastic. I'm going to have one and a half hours here. Uh, and then sure enough, Murphy's Law, after 20 minutes... Uh, for no rhyme or reason, my daughter was up for the day. So it doesn't, doesn't always pan out. But um, anyway, that's that's how I tend to approach it. And then in terms of, of me, I've, I've really got three focuses uh, in my life. And first and foremost, it's, it's family and an extension of that being friends. So friends and family. Uh, the second one is, is my health and fitness. And then the third one is business and investments. And I, I put them in the same category because my businesses, my online businesses fuel my investments. So the money that I make online is uh, directed into investments, which then give me back um, a lot of uh, passive income. And I've spoken about that in uh, previous episodes I've done where we speak about um, the wealth trilogy. And if you want to uh, check those out. You can see them on the Growth Booth episodes number 21, 22, and 23. And that's where we talk about uh, wealth building uh, and different ways that I've done that through uh, property and stock market and, and other different bits and pieces. But um, they're the three things for me. And if it doesn't, if there's something that comes up and it doesn't really fit in that category, then I just, I just say no to it. So I had an example of this is I had a friend of a friend visiting uh, Buenos Aires and um, they reached out and they said oh you know I'd love to catch up and I would have loved to have caught up as well but I have so many family commitments and commitments with my friends not to mention you know uh, health and fitness and and my businesses that I just had to say no you know um, you can't be everything to everyone and Another another time, another thing, sort of building on knowing when enough is enough, knowing when to say no, is I think oftentimes with finances, you hit a point beyond which having more money doesn't make you happier. And I've read studies about this. I don't. It's it's probably it's definitely different for different people depending on where you are are in the world. But I've seen people hustle themselves into a state where they are just not happy. They grind themselves away for. A little bit more money and a little bit more money and a little bit more money but they would have been so much happier just saying hey hang on a minute you know i'm comfortable like this enough is enough uh and i'm going to focus on not being that guy that is completely skewed towards one end of the spectrum uh or uh the other so um i think knowing when enough is is enough and, and also i think by design trying to invest your time in systems that are scalable because then or, or building teams uh, around something because that at that point you know you can disappear for weeks or months and come back and your business is even bigger and and when you're able to do that I think that's the real acid test for your systems and your business is 
if you disappeared for six months, would you come back and would it be in a better state than it is now? And if the answer is yes, then you've probably cracked the code. And if it's no, then you need to think about what can you do to get to a point where where that can happen. So in terms of businesses, you know, I think when anyone um, hears your name and or, or finds you online, one of the things that occurs is they hear about this concept called e-farming. I'm keen to get the 10,000 foot overview around what e-farming is all about, why it's a interesting business model, and also to get you back on another um, on another episode at some stage to really dive down deep into it some more. So could you share a little bit for our audience here today? Yeah, absolutely. So you want to think of the concept of e-farming as a, like a concept of uh, planting seeds in the garden and those garden growing into trees that give you fruit. Um, and the reason you want to think about it this way is because it's a very leveraged way to make money. I'll give you an example. So the size of your income can largely be dependent with e-farming on the size of your e-farm. And um, what's really interesting is that uh, back, uh, let's say back in uh, 2016, my e-farm was one size, right? And and back in, say, 2019, it grew a little bit. So what's re really interesting is that between those three years, I tripled my income. However, I did not work three times the hours and I did not work three times more intensely during those hours. What happened was my e-farm grew. That was the only thing. And what's interesting is that the e-farm, at least using my system, the e-farm grows automatically. In other words, you, you set up systems to grow the e-farm rather than trying to grow that e-farm yourself. What ends up happening, you, you build this big asset over time. So it starts small and then you grow it, grow it, grow it, grow it. And uh, this, this asset continues to produce income for you year after year while you continue to maintain it, to nurture it, to uh, water it, you know, watch the soil, etc. That's your job as an e-farmer. But the beauty of it is, is that it takes only a handful of hours each week to do. So once you've done the work up front and you set up your garden, right, your e-farm, that's when you switch to operating it or maintaining it and continuously gradually growing it which again happens automatically without you having to actually go and try to like force it by hand so the concept of e-farming was really life-changing for me because if you really think about it it's it's a classic example of switching from um working or trading hours for dollars uh, to actually recognizing that you can build a system that produces income for you. So you, you almost want to think about it like owning a real estate property because the real estate property that pays you cash flow, that pays you rent, uh, where you've got tenants, for example, and it pays you rent, right? Um, if it covers your mortgage and all the interest rates, etc., it becomes an asset that continues to produce month after month. Now, the only difference is between an e-farm and a real estate unit is that first off, you start growing it, you build it, you don't just buy it, okay? Uh, but that's also an advantage because you can start with very little next to nothing and continuously grow it, but there's also no limit to how big you can scale it. So in other words, the real estate unit is, is limited by the square footage, by the area where it's located, whatever. Well, your e-farm can continuously grow and grow and grow. Sure, sometimes it'll grow a little bit. Sometimes it'll grow much faster. But the point being is that there is the this potential to continue to grow it and grow it and grow it and to continue to cash out virtually every day. That's another concept. Uh, another thing about e-farm I really love is with a real estate unit, you cash out once a month and you're limited by the market conditions or regulation. Like for example, here in Canada, where I live right now, you're, it's regulated. You can't just you know, raise your rent. It's, it's, you know, the government won't allow you to, so you're limited. But with e-farming, you can cash out every day and the limit is only where you set it, which means if you want to make more money, you grow your e-farm e further and you continue to optimize it so it can continue to uh, uh, pay you dividends. I, I love this uh, idea of sort of planting a seed uh, speaking metaphorically here and being able to harvest it over and over again. You mentioned uh, your background uh, growing up. So my mom was a teacher, uh, is still actually a teacher. And uh, my dad was a farmer. 
Um, and in fact, uh, they still live on the, the family farm uh, back in, in New Zealand. And this whole idea of being able to, to plant a seed, to watch it grow, to nurture it, and then be able to harvest it and then do it all over again has always kind of resonated with me from an investment standpoint, but also from a business standpoint. Um, regarding the way you do e-farming, is it something that is more specifically related to um, e-commerce, affiliate marketing, building an audience, all of the above? Is there any more specifics that you could give us around uh, sort of the, I guess, the, the business model? I've, I've learned a little bit about the, the philosophy and the idea about you know, you've got this thing leveraging and it's working for you and it's growing on autopilot. What about the specifics, if you like, of, of what it is all about? Sorry to keep things kind of blind, uh, because first I want to make sure people understand why it's so fascinating before, before I start revealing what it is. Uh, because a lot of times if I just straight out say it, they simply don't believe it can be that lucrative. But here's the deal with e-farming. E in e-farming stands for email. I should I should add here as well. So sorry to interrupt you. Is that I know that there's a lot more that we can discuss about this. So um, let's sort of promise one another that we'll get on another call or something like that where we can dive into it with more detail. Um, maybe we could even do a Zoom call or something so we can see more about what you're doing because I don't want any of the power of this just to be be lost in, in the podcast if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. But let me let me share one thing that I think will be really beneficial to give people a more uh, concrete idea of what we're talking about here. So e-farming is first off, let's let I had to say this, I didn't, but it has nothing to do with actual farming. So you don't you don't need to go and, you know, have a plow and have a horse and a tractor, nothing like that. It's also not yield farming, which means it has nothing to do with cryptocurrencies or any anything like that. Now, e-farming, e in e-farming stands for email. And why email? Why are we farming emails? What is that even? Are we like spamming people? No. What we're doing is we're building what I call email farms because, and I don't think many people know this, but you know this, you felt it for yourself too. You've seen the impact of this because email or email addresses are probably one of the most profitable assets you can own and have in an online business or in any business for that matter. Because email as a media, is to this day, by the way, with all the TikToks and all the social network and everything, it's still the most profitable way to communicate with people with offers and products and services. Which means anyone who owns an email farm gets to make a lot of money. To give an example, like a mediocre email farm will probably produce about 50 cents, maybe 35 cents per email address, okay, per month. Which means if you've got a really bad e-farm that's the size of a thousand then you're still making 350 bucks a month but on a good e-farm an e-farm like for example like iron an e-farm like aiden runs you're looking at double digit dollar value per email subscriber per month which means a 1000 email farm can actually produce you an income of of a good several thousand dollars every single month in a leveraged way where you don't have to toil and, and break your back every single time to earn that money. In fact, a good e-farmer, okay, and I'm not exaggerating this, a good e-farmer produces more in a day than many people who work average jobs make in a month of working eight hour days and really, really grinding it out. That's the power of owning an e-farm. It gives you tremendous leverage and of course, lifestyle and freedom. Yeah, you know, um, the the one thing that I've noticed over the past 17 years is the value in emails and, and having an email subscriber that you've built a relationship with has never ever dropped. In fact, it hasn't got lower. It, it's even increased, I think, with all the uh, you know hot air that's out there these days and with all the social media platforms, people often think that they need to be on TikTok with a huge audience or they need to be on Instagram with a huge audience. But I can tell you from personal experience that I would much rather have uh, you know, 1,000 email subscribers than 10,000 or 20,000 Instagram followers. They're just uh, like apples and oranges. They're completely different and the way that you can communicate and the way that you can monetize is completely different and the way that you can provide value 
uh, is also completely different. The other thing about email is that you can leverage it in so many different ways. I mean, we've got a, a huge e-commerce business and uh, believe it or not, it's a physical product business, but what is one of the key ingredients and the key tools that allows us to monetize? Email. The exact same thing is true in the way that we build our affiliate websites, our CPA websites. The exact same thing is true in our software businesses. Every single one of our businesses seem to have this one thing, this one ingredient in common. So um, Igor, I really look forward to diving into this more with you and, and learning exactly uh, what you do. So we'll get something scheduled here and we'll um, be able to come back and discuss this in, in much more detail. So in the meantime though, uh, we will get this episode published over at the Growth Booth episode number 59. We'll put uh, links there as well to where people can get your book, which is again at igorsbook.com. Check that out uh, and transcripts and, and all the other good stuff. So um, Igor, I'm conscious of, of time here. Thank you for being here with us today, um, I know that you would have, um, you know, wet a lot of ap appetites here by talking about the e farming, and we'll come back to it. But uh, also, it's been fascinating to learn about how you juggle uh, your businesses and your life with family and 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 everything else. So, thanks for being here. My pleasure, man. Thanks for hosting me. All right, guys, that's a wrap for episode number 59. Head over to thegrowthbooth.com, navigate to episode number 59. Remember to follow along wherever you listen to this podcast, be it on Spotify, be it on Apple uh, Music, be it on YouTube, or, of course, on thegrowthbooth.com. And I will see you on the next episode of The Growth Booth, and I am going to get uh, Igor back uh, in the very near future to talk more about exactly what he's doing uh, which is so lucrative right now with email. So that's a wrap. We'll see you on the next episode.